What kind of advice could you give to executives for their online presence? It's really the key question that a lot of people are wrestling with. I think probably like almost all people that work in business have been interested in the topic of machine learning and AI for the last five years. You've just been sharing incredibly valuable insight and, and advice with us, Dr. Van Green. <laughs> You work with many top leaders. How would you define key leadership behavior, specifically now during these difficult times? What what advice could you give to our listeners? I'm so happy that you guys do this. It's not something I think that is thought of quite a bit in business. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Excellence Talk. As usual, together with Dr. Christian Forstner, we are welcoming an important guest. And today we will talk a very interesting topic about professional reputation management and tenant branding solutions. We have a guest, Ben Breen. He's the founder and executive chairman of Cunery, an award-winning professional reputation management and talent branding solutions company. Cunery was listed as one of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in America by Inc. Magazine and was also listed as one of the 360 best companies by Entrepreneur Magazine in 2018 and 2019. Hello, Christian. Hi, Murat. Good to see you. And what a pleasure to have Bant here in our interview today. It's nice to be here, guys. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure for us to welcome you here. And I have the first question. You have founded Cunery in 2012, providing professional reputation, management, and talent branding solutions. What inspired you to start this business? How did you start and find your first customers? I was working at a large marketing group up to 2012 that basically did marketing communication solutions for lots and lots of companies all around the world. One of the things that I noticed while I was there was that there seemed to be a limited amount of focus on the online presence for individuals, for executives. There were plenty of tools that were in the marketplace that were focused around brands, helping brands optimize themselves, helping brands grow more effectively, helping brands buy media more effectively. But there was very little that was focused around individuals. And at the time, there were a lot of things happening from a technical perspective where the reach that brands could get online on social media channels through the various algorithms was being ratcheted down. It was becoming harder for brands to reach the audiences they wanted to focus on. And so I felt that there was a real opportunity and a need to build out a solution that helped executives make the most of their online presence because honestly, I felt that it really mattered. It mattered because I personally was going online to Google to look people up before I met them or after I met them to decide whether I wanted to do business with them. I found myself getting more and more of my news and information from other executives, other peers, because I wanted, I found that the ones that I trusted were the most trusted of sources that I could get to. So all of those things were key. The answer to your question about our first customers is a really good one. You know, we did, I think, what most tech companies do. We built a platform and we released it to the world. So it was a free product and we released it to the world. And we actually got quite a few people to sign up. I think we got about 30,000 people that signed up to the first version of our solution. And so we were patting ourselves on the back. We thought, we were, you know, on our way to becoming the next Google. But when we started to offer kind of a freemium model, starting to try to upcharge in, in a way, we suddenly found that those 30,000 didn't really amount to anything, didn't really amount to a real business. And at the time, you know, we were trying to figure out what to do with that. And I, I shared what we had built with an executive at Mondelez, a guy named Bon and Bao, who's a relatively famous chief digital officer you'll read about him. He's done some pretty amazing things over the last decade, most notably a television show with the basketball player LeBron James. And he saw what we had built and he said, this is awesome. I love it. Can you do this for my company, for my team? And the light bulb went off to us and we were, we immediately realized, Eureka, we have more of a an enterprise product. And that really was the start. You know, we signed up Mondelez. We still work with them today. And that opened the doors to us really building out the model.
Bernd, over the last couple of months, we faced extraordinary times due to the pandemic situation. Online presence and the voice have become much more important. What kind of advice could you give to executives for their online presence? It's really the key question that a lot of people are wrestling with. We are living through a challenging, turbulent moment in the communications industry. Traditionally, at times like this, a lot of communications executives or a lot of PR firms would have advised executives really to kind of hold back, kind of say very little actually. The reality is that over the time we've launched Canary, the truth is that silence is a message in and of itself. So so I guess there's an executive at Burger King named Fernando Machado that wrote a great post about this where he said that, you know, if an executive decides to be silent, be confident and be in your silence. If an executive decides to say something, be confident in what you say, but look into inside yourself and decide what you want to do. I think that his quote really captures the moment perfectly for executives. You really need to be confident in your beliefs and, and share that. It's We're in an age now where the executive can't really be neutral on issues. You really have to kind of take a take a position and a stand. So I think that's the first thing. Second thing is consistency of messaging, which is obviously true in almost every topic. You know, make sure that you're consistent across channels. Third thing is that, you know, for something like COVID, where executives have gotten it wrong is when they start to act as if they're experts on the virus. And so it's just important to kind of remember where we are leaders, where we have excellence, right? So if you are a somebody like a media technology executive like myself, certainly me kind of giving quotes about the finer points of virus, it's just a miss. And so what we've said is to make sure that you kind of align your topic in a way that is relevant for align the topic that you focus on as a company or as an individual with COVID. So, for example, we have one client who is focused on water sustainability. And so we've been able to work with her to craft a way that that water sustainability story is in alignment with talking about coronavirus. You know, how is coronavirus impacting that topic? Same thing we've done with sports executives on the topic of things like Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is a major movement in the United States right now. We have massive social issues and upheaval where people are raising really, really important topics and, you know, how executives handle this, how they talk about this and how they're open to the discussion will really define their legacies. Thank you, Bent. You work with many top leaders all over the world. How would you define key leadership behavior, specifically now during these difficult times? I think following on the last question, it's a bit similar. I think that the key things that I've noticed are that the leaders that are making an impact show a level of openness. So you'll see them sharing kind of like the internal discussions and meetings and things like that. A lot of like the stuff that you see on Zoom, there's a more openness of, to be human. There's definitely a focus on messages with action. So one of the other areas that I think leaders have missed on and during this COVID period is they'll get the empathetic messaging right, but they don't link that with action that they're taking. And so the ones that are certainly strong are the ones that have really kind of linked it back into doing. We're not living through a moment where leaders can just pacify. Leaders are being expected to action as a key word here. And you are an entrepreneur and the founder of an award-winning startup company. What advice could you give to young entrepreneurs who think of starting something like you? I love being an entrepreneur. I kind of feel like I had a, an entrepreneurial quality in my whole career throughout my whole life. Um, but the reality is I spent the first half of my career working for very large companies. And I did find myself gravitating constantly in those big companies to groups that were supporting uh, startups or entrepreneurial activity, what we would have called intrapreneurial 
activity inside big companies. So, mm-hmm. you know, I set up quite a few agencies over the years inside larger agency holding groups, and I've invested in lots of technologies. I think that, you know, right now, everyone is looking at it. It's a time where we certainly have, I would say, a massive changing of the guard, changing of kind of the status quo. And it's actually a really good time to challenge yourself if you're entrepreneurial in nature to take one of those challenges and develop a better solution. I think that around the world, we can still do a lot better job in supporting entrepreneurialism. I'm, you know, I'm sitting here in Europe today and in Spain, I'd love to see the country and the policies here support, you know, more entrepreneurialism. And I think there's countries like that around the world. America has been quite a good place to start a company. And that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of the big companies to date have actually come from there. But I think we can do a better job in supporting entrepreneurs around the world and making policies support that. It's so unbelievably important for us to have a healthy crop of entrepreneurs coming up with new ideas. Society literally is so dependent on small to medium sized businesses that don't really get much focus. And if we don't help these folks build, we're really doing all of ourselves a a tremendous disservice. So it's not going to be easy. I think, you know, it's been said before, and it's a very true statement, which is I think a lot of reasons why entrepreneurs tend to be quite young in many cases, you know, these famous tech entrepreneurs is because they just don't know any better. You know, they, they don't know the insanity that they're stepping into. But I would say that it's, it's definitely a worthwhile exercise and just keep kind of pushing. I have too many thoughts on entrepreneurialism to just kind of bucket it in this one statement today. But I think that there's a lot more work we could all be doing to support that ecosystem. And I do think it's extremely important. <laughs> Thank you, Bent. In addition to your work in Canary, in your free time, I'm sure that you have difficulties to find free time. You have been doing a PhD on the research area of the impact of artificial intelligence, AI, on marketing and communication practitioners. Could you please tell us more about it? I think probably like almost all people that work in business have been interested in the topic of machine learning and AI for the last five years. And I was teaching at a university in Spain called Blancarna on marketing topics, marketing 101 basic topics. And they asked me if I would consider being a PhD candidate, which I accepted. And I ended up completing a PhD in March of this year on the topic of, as I said, a, you know, a, you, you outline AI and really how it's perceived and utilized today in the media and marketing space. You know, I think that the topic of AI in many respects, like many, many topics that get a lot of media coverage, suffered from the hype and the inability for media and marketing companies, at, the, at least in that first stage, to fully integrate and understand. What I'm seeing now is AI certainly is almost in every media and marketing discipline at this stage. You'll see it playing a critical role in call centers, critical role in any form of like a chat bot, critical role in anything related to do with customer service. We're seeing AI playing a lot of background roles, trying to really make the most of data. A lot of times that what I uncovered was that whilst marketers were very excited about AI, they found that their organizations simply were not ready to make the most of AI because the data that they had was not structured correctly, or they just didn't have the data that really mattered for what they wanted to be achieving. And then I think that, you know, we found that the stage of media and marketing was that there was a lot of that kind of you know, exuberance on the topic. Media and marketing executives were excited for sure about the topic, but they were also tremendously naive about it. So they had no real understanding except for what they'd seen in a Hollywood blockbuster on what AI actually could mean for their businesses. And so we haven't really seen enough companies yet embrace what AI 
could mean or will mean over the next decade. In the thesis, I talk a lot about, you know, what is happening right now and what that impact, what the impact of those things will be over the next three, five, ten years. And it is unbelievably significant. And I don't think that the industry has thought about the organizational impact yet of this. I'm not really thinking about jobs. I, you know, the job issue, I think everyone thinks that, you know, this is the Hollywood myth of like being replaced by a robot. The opportunity for the next generation of executives is actually good. It's tremendously positive. There will be more opportunities here with AI. The challenge though is how do you weave that the capability into a, a new structure? I'll give you a quick example of this. You know, if you're a company that is a design company, in the past, the way being a designer works is that you would work your way up from being like assistant designer to a junior designer to a senior designer to then being the top dog. Well, those roles where you start are not fun roles. You're do the work you're doing is really quite pedantic in many respects. Imagine a world where all of the that work is now handled by a capability that is driven by machine learning. Well, on one hand, you say, oh, that's incredibly efficient. I guess I don't need all those junior people. Say, well, okay, that's okay. But how do you train people to become those great designers of the future? You know, I think in some ways AI is okay for the people that are the veterans that can look at something and can see excellence and understand it, etc. But for people that are coming up and learning, how do they learn alongside AI? I think that I lobby for is really this understanding of much deeper need for education is required across the board in the media and marketing field so that we build a system that is actually human friendly and that we don't end up with these kind of draconian systems where people are like, oh, well, I guess I don't need any employees anymore. It's, it's actually just not true, right? So in my own business in Canary, we think about AI a lot. We actually use it for quite a bit in our own business. And all it does is just, it allows us to increase the complexity and the quality of our work. You've just been sharing incredibly valuable insight and, and advice with us, Dr. Van Free. <laughs> Uh, this is a conversation that we call excellence talks. So obviously our last question needs to relate to excellence. What, what advice could you give to our listeners how to make the world better or even excellent? The, the pursuit of excellence is probably, I'm so happy that you guys do this. It's not something I think that is thought of quite a bit in business. I feel that what ends up happening in business is that it's the pursuit of just getting stuff done or pursuit of just literally getting over the next hurdle. But excellence, you know, you see these stories of excellence in every area of life. I mean, I have just been amazed. I had the uh, chance to watch Novak Djokovic uh, Mm -hmm. um, train for the US Open here in Spain. He lives here in Spain. And just to see the drive and what is expected and the variables that they look at and the need for short-term planning. And it's all part of that goal for achieving excellence. I think this is something I think about a lot because I went to a university, I'll use another sports analogy, in America called Duke University. It's most famous for its basketball team. Right? <laughs> and and the basketball team, I think, probably could just be, I think, if summed up as a symbol of excellence. It is a team that has won championship after championship after championship. And to win a championship to once is an incredible achievement. To do it time and time and time and time again is what I think about every day in my own company. How do I make sure that every process every way that we deal with our company achieves excellence and that we never get comfortable with just being okay. It's not, unfortunately, I wish there was just one thing I could say, this is the one thing that kind of achieves excellence. You know, I would say that for me, it's, you know, in my own career, I never get too far away from the coal face. And it's just a way of me staying honest. I actually will sit on sales calls even to this day for Canary. And I do it because it's the way for me to understand what people want, what people need, where things are going. How can we make sure that our solution is excellent, right? Always delivering what they need and more, right? 
The people that want to achieve excellence are never happy with just kind of making it through. Yeah. So it's a great, great word. It's a great goal. And I wish that we spent more time in our lives trying to be excellent and making sure. So it's a very good thing to kind of pause and just say, how can I make this really meaningful for people, purposeful for people? How can we kind of be empathetic for what their needs are? Those are all things that we think a lot about in Canary. Fantastic definition of excellence. Murat, what do you think? Indeed, it was fantastic definition of excellence and it was a great insight for all the professional who they want to work on the professional reputation and then their talent branding. It was also great insight for the entrepreneur, great insight for the leaders all over the world. Thank you very much, Ben, for all these great advices and information and knowledge you share with us. Great. Well, thank you guys. It's been wonderful to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you.